after we have a signed purchase agreement. So um, just a few things, just so you guys know, when after signing a purchase agreement, we want to make sure that all the documents, everything, before we send it to our TC, our transaction coordinator, we want to make sure we have everything on that checklist for them. For them to have to run around and ask us for things other than an EMV, which sometimes might not be at the time of signing, um, we should have everything over to um, the transaction coordinator. So that, again, he's got a lot of us to work with, or they have a lot um, of agents that are turning docu documents in. And it just makes it so much easier. I also would suggest, um, if you guys wouldn't mind reading over this, but if you guys would please, please, please make sure that you also put it in FUB. Put your documents in FUB so that um, hmm. if you have to go back, if say they miss something, sometimes you know documents get lost. Um, a copy of the EMV, or maybe the other agent lost a piece of, um, you know, a document, a seller's disclosure, whatever it is, an addendum. We want to make sure that we have them so that we can help out our transaction coordinator as well. I think that's really important. So again, everybody does their own business and they all do it differently. We don't do everything the same, guys. We do things a little different than me and Adam or whatever. So what we're just trying to do is make this efficient and as smooth as possible. Um, so I guess right here, it's saying the first thing is that, you know, our processes, even though we as agents do things maybe a little out of order than somebody else, we definitely want to follow that ending checklist and make sure everything's in at one time to our transaction coordinator. Um, these guidelines that were set up are set up to help ourselves and make sure we're organized, but it's also to make sure that we are doing all of the steps that are required for our team, just to make it, you know, like I said, as smooth as possible for everybody. Um, so basically, if you're following your guidelines, you're making sure your checklist is all done, like I said, other than your EMV, because that can be wired, as you guys all know. <laughs> Um, or if we're waiting to collect a check with it, it again, on your purchase agreement, it's going to say 24, 48 hours, whatever, you know, just make sure you collect it and then, um, make a copy, put it in your club and then get it over to your team. Um, some of the steps again, I, I'm kind of not going off of this exactly, but just kind of read through it. We are, um, Going to number three, I think that's the, the next one that's going to hit is the buyer. This is kind of the question that you guys are going to answer for me. But when you guys are newer, when you're getting an inspector or a buyer asks you, hey, I need an inspector, you guys can provide those inspectors. Do you provide one, two, three? How do you guys go about getting your inspectors? Uh, over to your buyers. When we first started the like freshman class or whatever last year, mm -hmm. um, we were told to provide three lenders, or three inspectors, anything like that, and then stress it. You can still like Google whoever you want, pick whoever you want, but here are suggestions. Mm -hmm. And I feel like as time has gone on, it seems like that has been, we've been more advised to give one or say, hey, this is my inspector, this is the inspector you're using. Mm -hmm. Essentially, try to steer more in that direction. Mm -hmm. But that probably does make sense. If something right. does go wrong in the inspection and you only give one recommendation, mm -hmm. right, Heather. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. you're absolutely right. I always provide more than one. I don't mm -hmm. Yeah, you, know, you want to cover your butt, basically. You don't want to just give one. You definitely want, I mean, we all work with specific inspectors that we feel comfortable with, we have a rapport with. And we know that obviously um, some of them are long-winded. We know those eight, those inspectors. <laughs> but again, our job is to provide, you know, information for our buyers that they have no clue as far as inspectors. They really, most of them don't. What we're trying to do is we're trying to give them inspectors that we've had a rapport with, but not just one. I personally 
have a couple that I work with all the time. And I honestly will give the phone number and say, it's on you guys to make those appointments and then to call me and let me know so I can set it up, obviously, with showing time and make sure that everybody's on the same page. Again, do not just steer them one way. You have to give them more than one inspector. You have to. If they're going to say, well, who do you recommend? Again, say, you know what? I work with a few really good ones. You can't go wrong with either one. But try not to steer them in one direction because it could come back and bite you in the rear end. So. Right. I think the way we had that conversation, the words we use is really important. Because <laughs> if I say, you know, these are ones I've worked with before, now I'm being really unclear kind of about the life. Like I'm not liable. If I say these are, this is an inspector my clients have had success with in the past, but I want to be clear that this is the person who is inspecting your home. So you've got to choose them. You've got to look at their reviews. You've got to do the due diligence. I can't do that for you. you got right. that. Yeah. Absolutely. So even if you give them one or three, say these are inspectors that I've used in the past, but you know, <laughs> like Stein said, we just want to get rid of that liability now. Um, as far as that goes, you know, yeah. they're they're excellent. I worked with them, but I think you should research other inspectors if you'd like 100%. and choose whoever, you know. It's your need. Yep. Because we don't want that response. No, no. We have enough on our plate mm -hmm. and we have enough that we have to make sure is going correct and smooth with our buyers that we don't need that added, you know, liability, so to speak. We just don't need it. So um again, great answers to, from you know, with this inspector. Just keep those in mind, you guys. Um also at, or Austin and I ran into this. Number four, make sure it's Certain counties, certain cities, they have cert, uh, city certs that we have to make sure that, you know, those certs and those certifications, we have those completed. At the time, we're talking buyers, but uh, listings too. Um, we got to make sure our sellers are getting their certifications because you're going through this whole process, you're busy, you're not paying attention, and all of a sudden, boom, did you get your city cert? Is it approved? Uh-oh, now we're holding up closing, guys. So depending on the city, and if you don't know, like Shiawassee, again, I think Brooke put something in Trello with the, set of the cities that um, require some of the certs. Make sure you're looking to make sure you guys are getting these done because it will hold up closing. Austin and I, like I said, we had that happen in Romulus, and it's a lot of the downward. It's a headache, <laughs> isn't it, Austin? Yeah, we had a we had a real doozy. So, um, just again, that's something that your buyer's not going to know. They're not going to know these things. So that's where we, as a professional, are ahead of the game, and we're making sure that these things are taken care of. You might want to explain what a city cert is to everybody. Yeah, so a city certification is, you know, like when you're building a brand new home, you have to go through and get all of the different um, approvals on the foundation, the framing, <clears throat> everything that goes into the home. When people sell homes in certain municipalities, they want to recertify that home and make sure there's nothing dangerous in it. They're no usually hazard. looking for like a sidewalk that's heaving so someone with a trip and fall, um, right. lead paint, stuff yeah. like that. And some of these city certs, like the city of Romulus, they're tough. They are a pain in the butt. I mean, literally, they're very difficult. So you guys, please make sure that you're getting those taken care of right in the beginning of your uh, transaction so that you don't have any hiccups before closing. And then everybody's like, shoot, and they're all stranded. It's just not a good situation. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It's, it's a city. No. You get the city cert or a point of sale. Uh, yeah. You probably can. I don't see why not. They're preparing for that. They had to do it. If they didn't buy a new bill, they know what that process is. They know they had to get one. I mean, sellers forget though, too. I mean, if they've been living in the house 20, 30 years, they're not going to remember. So that's our job as a listing agent to say, hey, we know you need city search. Why don't you go and get this taken care of right now? So that most, most of the time, like, we take two weeks before we go live. That should give them enough time to do what they need to do to get ready for listing their home as well. So, um, yeah. Number five, um, 
call the lender to let them know that you have an accepted offer. I always reach out to my lender. I always have communication with my lender from the very beginning. Then I know that most of the time the, the transaction coordinator will get those docs over. I kind of proactive. If I'm going to send my stuff over to Mindy, I'm sending it. I'm CCing my lender too. Mm -hmm. I'm giving them the package so they can start their job. Mm -hmm. You know, if we're all in communication, this thing is going to go so much smoother. And again, your lender appreciates it mm -hmm. because maybe then you have 20 offers in on her desk, you know, and she's trying to get through them and it takes her a couple of days. I can push CC and put the lender's name in there and get that sent over as well. So try to get the... Um, purchase an agreement, the full executed offer over to the lender. They want everything that Mindy wants, basically. Am I correct? Absolutely. So th does that help you guys out, Adam? The, when we the send sooner we can get an accepted bottom line signature contract, that's the, the better. Because then we can hit the ground running with it. So. And I've heard, and this is how I did it in the past, because I've been doing it a while. We used to have to do the, all of our paperwork ourselves. But what we used to do is wait for the inspection. That is not a good practice, guys. It's not at all because that can take seven days. But in seven days, a lender can be doing their job. Mm -hmm. They can be doing the things they need to do. We have a hiccup. Nine times out of 10, the inspection is not going to stop the actual sale. So get it in right away, but get it to the lender at the same time you're getting it to your TC. It's really, I think, really important. And keep those lines of communication open. I always, I, I touch base, whether it's a text, hey, how's it going to my lender, making sure that we're all on the same page. If there's, you know, problem, kind of want to know about it. Doesn't mean my buyer needs to know that I know, or it doesn't mean that I have to tell the other side that something's going on or you know, they're having a problem. Somebody bought a car and they weren't supposed to, you know, we don't say any of that. It's just for our own knowledge. So we know how this is going to go. If we're going to be closing on time, are we going to have to get ready for addendums? Are we going to have to do, you know, a couple of extra steps to get to that closing table? So communication, if that lender's not calling you, it's because they're busy. Shoot them a text real quick. Hey, Adam, how's it going? How's this file going? They're going to give you a real quick response. Everything's going well. Um, you know, and so on. So again, communicate with your lender as well as um, the TC and make sure everything's good. Open communication again with the listing agent. You're always going to want to make sure, guys, that you're talking to the other side. You're building a rapport not only with your buyer, but you're doing it with the listing agent. You're doing it um, with the whole group that's involved in your transaction. Um, sometimes it makes it a lot better down the road. You won't run into this lender or this scale again or agent again, and you might have an offer to give them. And there's a multi-offer uh, multi situation going on, highest and best, but because they had such a smooth ride with you, they're going to remember that. And guess what? That might put you over top. I just had that happen in Ann Arbor this past week. I communicated, I had a good conversation with the agent. There were four offers on the table. I just, honestly, we shot the shit. We didn't even talk really about the offer. We were talking about other things. She was from Northville and we just got on a different tangent of a conversation, but we had a good rapport. So when my offer got, she told me what the other, she told me what the other offer was and we squeaked in and we got the deal. Again, keeping that Communication open with the other side is really helpful. And you can definitely go a lot further with uh, good communication with the listing agent. Um, we already talked about Bub and the fully executed offer and the EMV, the pre approval, all of that stuff in Bub. Um, I guess it's basically about all. It, like I said, it's not going to be a long, drawn-out conversation up here um, about any of this stuff. If you guys have questions, more or less, I'd rather you ask. If there's anything you guys have come across that Mr. Adam might have. Um, it's not a question. It's just uh, kind of just to reinforce the relationship that you have with your new buyer. <laughs> you know, first-time home buyer. Explain these things to you. Yeah. Because the importance of knowledge and education that you give them, the more trust they're going to have with you. 
So when you're first meeting somebody, obviously you're creating the rapport, you're talking about stuff other than real estate specifically. But when the rubber meets the road, they need to know these types of things that are going to happen. You have to forecast this stuff <clears throat> in the future, right? Because they don't want to be bombarded or surprised by certain things that you already know you should have told them, but you did, mm -hmm. right? And, and that tool in, in, in Trello also, the tool in Trello, the match that we sometimes give our first time home buyers and stuff, that's really helpful because they don't know those steps. They don't know what they're doing. They don't, they're they're unaware. I mean, of course, there are people out there that have bought four or five homes and they're aware of those things, but your first time home buyers, they hold their hand the whole way through from the beginning to the end. You've got to help them understand certain things. They get confused, they get frustrated, they get stressed out, they're nervous. This is a big deal to them. And if, like Adam said, you've got to guide them the whole way through. If you're guiding them, I'll tell you, you know, this might be their first house, but they're going to come back to you for their second house or third house, as long as, you know what, you're keeping in communication with them afterwards, and you're also doing the right thing by them, and you're teaching them along the way. That really is going to be helpful along, you know, down the road. Um, referral business is the best, guys, you know, and if you have a great buyer, and you know this is their first home, and they're going to build on that. It wouldn't it be nice to know your referral business is growing because you took care of them in the beginning? I mean, that's how I grew my business. It's it's literally just communicating, talking with them, giving them knowledge that they did not have, and giving them a giving them a a positive at the end of giving them the keys and saying congratulations. They're they're excited. You just went through something that was very stress-free for them. And that's what our job is. Take that stress off of the buyer and let them know this is supposed to be fun. This is exciting, not a, a negative thing by any means. So does anybody else have any other questions or? So on number two, mm -hmm. um, I would definitely be communicating that with your lender on the EMD, where it's coming from. Yep. I ran into issues countless times because you know, hey, uh, buyer gets under contract and all of a sudden we have money that transfers, but it's not where the money was supposed to come from. So I think just having that conversation, you know, you guys are probably in touch with, with us or with your, you know, whoever the lender is ahead of time anyway, talking about the pre-approval. Hey, give me an updated pre-approval. Okay, just want to confirm, you know, we're good to we're good to get a check from from the checking account or we're we're going to do a gift for this EMD because a lot of times, I mean, it just it, it's a bad taste to the, to the listing agent if we have to right at the last minute remove an EMD. So, um, you know, that's that's one thing that uh, that I would say, you know, definitely make sure you're checking checking the box on that EMD, knowing where it's coming from and that it is verified by the lender. Mm -hmm. um, number four comes from most times, right, when we have a, a split closing. So we have Royal listing side has whoever most of the time we get that at the very end when they're doing the back and forth so if you guys ever do have any questions early on in the transaction make sure you're talking to the listing agent even verify with their title company hey who are you using on your side for title yeah. and that might be something that's already on your guys's checklist it is we have that we have a list guys and i'm sure y'all seen it in trello too but it does it asks you if you're using rt royal title or if you, are you using another and who is it you got to put that down because again, we need to know that they need to know that yeah. they need to know who they're working with so that, you know, when it's time to close, they're giving them the docs, correct? You got to give them yeah. the. For sure. So, and yeah. how that goes at the very end is, so we send our numbers to Royal, Royal sends it to whoever's representing the sell side, then they bounce it back and then it comes up. So even though we're trying to move a lot, you know, a lot faster than we can, parts. Than yeah. just some parts. And a lot of times that's when it gets discovered that, Hey, we have to get this cert from the city of Clio, you know, it's like, okay, yeah. why didn't we know this already? Exactly. So. Yeah. And I'll tell you, it, it, it comes up more because you're so busy trying to get everything working, the appraisal or the uh, inspections and working with the lender on the appraisal. It's just whatever it is, it, you don't remember that all the time. I was one of those. <laughs> We were one of those for Romulus, and like I said, that was a headache. And guys, you don't want to be in that position because you look like a turd after that. You really do. So, you know what? I just screwed up. So we're human. We make mistakes. But again, we try to do a lot of things, and there's a lot of moving parts, and we're making sure that, um, you know, we're getting everything that the lender needs, what 
you know, our TC needs and so on. So anyway, um, I would just add, like, um, if it's a condominium, mm -hmm. uh, make sure that you're getting the master deed and the bylaws to the lender, because that can also cause hiccups later. Um, making sure that it's warrantable or not warrantable, and the lender will be able to find that out. Um, That's a huge one, guys, too. The warrantable. Yeah, that is a big one because there's a lot of lenders that do not do that type of financing. They will not do it. There's a lot of, I don't I don't know if you guys do it or no. not. Do you, we, you don't? We do don't. We have an outlet for it, but it's, we right. don't do it confidently. Yeah. So it's just, one of I just say, it's, it's, it can be challenging. What a non warranted, you know, condo situation would look it, like. It, well, a non warrantable condo is where one, the developer owns more, a percentage more. I don't know how I Two -thirds. word this. <laughs> They're going to have more interest in it than what like the association does. Yeah. So it isn't warrantable. And I, I, again, I'm not good at explaining this. I just know certain lenders will not because it's not under the federal guidelines, yeah, so, so, right? So Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac right. set certain qualifications for condos. Mm -hmm. um, if they, if these condos do not meet what they set, then it's considered a non-warrantable condo. Right. So um, it's not bad, guys. It's not bad at all. So is it usually portfolio loan? It it is a portfolio loan so or a bridge loan kind of thing. Loan. Yeah, mm -hmm. or a, or an arm. They'll do arms, Credit you know. Games. But again, Credit it's Michigan just. Credit unions will do them. State bank will do them. State bank does it. David Scott does it. She's not all doing this. So, but it's it's just you got to. These are the things that we're the professionals. We've got to find this stuff out. Like Karen was saying, it's it's the condo that can kind of hang you up sometimes. So make sure you're getting that information before you're even putting anything on paper. Make sure you know these things because they might, the buyer not, might not be approved for it, you know? And again, then you're kind of looking like an idiot. So with the condo, we call the association and ask whether they're... Well, technically, I think even the lender would know that. You would know that. So I know when I thought... Have to, it was like yeah, a lot of times we have to reach out directly to mm -hmm. the association. There's something called a, a condo questionnaire that they fill out for yes. us. Yeah, that that's the information we need to determine if it's going to be a, a warrantable condo or non warrantable condo. And then if you do got a non warrantable condo, typically you're going to have you know a little bit heavier of a down payment, so um, also a little bit higher of an interest rate typically on those as well. So um, just keep that in mind. If you guys are making an offer on a condo, be very much in contact with the lender first. Okay. okay. If they have a significant, like I think over 25 or 30 percent, they usually the interest rate is usually affected. That's okay. just when we found out this week on one because I thought it was going to be a half percent, three quarter percent higher, and I thought, well, that's crazy. But it just depends what their down payment is, like you said. Mm -hmm. um, and then, so if it's typically more than 20 percent, then there's not that additional fee. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a lot of things that you can get into the weeds with. I mean, literally, and that's again part of our job is to make sure that we're we're, we're spreading those weeds out and making sure we have a nice path for our clients. <laughs> and that means that we have to definitely do our due diligence and kind of check things out. If we're not really sure, go to your lender, go to the HOA, you know, get that information, look like the professional and, or ask questions, ask another agent. They might've already dealt with it and they already know that answer. You know, that's, that's what we're supposed to be doing so that, you know, we don't write an offer and then go, oops, sorry, you can't get this. This is non-warrantable and you don't qualify. Then you look like, you know, that causes some issues. So let's make sure that we're doing those steps ahead of time before putting things on paper with the condos and stuff. So, okay. Anything else? Everybody cool? Money's on. Yay, we're done.